So we're currently in this like um, bull market coming off a of halvening, and um, most people are expecting a bear market into 2022 because that's the cyclical nature, the four-year cycle of Bitcoin compared to you know like maybe a 10-year cycle for macro um, macro markets. Um, but <clears throat> what's interesting right now is that right now um, we're seeing a peak kind of reaccumulation by long-term investors um, and you know whenever you see this level of reaccumulation by long-term investors it's usually the fuel to drive another um, bullish rally you know of multiple months as we come into the fourth quarter of this year we expected a, a, a very strong rally um, and then a blow off top you know that's the normal um, the normal expectation on the cyclical nature but right now it's like wow the, the data is showing that um, the structure is completely different from every other cycle and um, if it's correct then this bull market is um, not going to end um, next like end of this year it's going to go well into next year and um, potentially there's a lot of evidence now I'm seeing quantitatively with this data to show that that four-year structure is breaking down um, so we were locked into this kind of four-year cycle and perhaps now we're <clears throat> we're breaking free of the gravitational pull of this this hardening impulse and um, the demand and supply from investors and all the parts of the ecosystem are more predominant and so in that regard we might just continue to run up with these um, typically 50% pullbacks um, which isn't much of a pullback if you've been in Bitcoin long enough you know we're used to like 80% pullback over a year um, and we've just had one of these 50% pullbacks and you know a consolidation of just barely over two months and then we're off to the races again so I could totally see that being the the more um, well the, the behavior of Bitcoin in the coming years where um, we do this kind of random walk of price discovery as it finds its um, price at, at network saturation um, where everyone's using um, this network. So yeah, um, that's the most interesting thing right now um, to me. When I look at the network, there's like, um, there's so many different metrics you can look at and they all get used in different parts of the cycle. Um, and currently the, the most um, reliable metrics are all the, the views into demand and supply, um, both locally and um, in the macro sense. So, um, you know, I'm looking at a chart right now in front of me and it's looking at what the long-term investors are doing. And so, for example, you now I work with um, Glassnode, which does the, the um, raw um, on-chain data and they process it. And it's a service that many people can use. Um, I pull that in. For example, like um, they do a metric called liquid supply, and you know you you can look at the the blockchain. You can see the millions and millions of addresses. There's multitude of addresses, and then they do the hard work of going these addresses, who owns them, and they can cluster these addresses into like what looks like entities, individual participants of that that have their wallets spread across all these addresses. And then they um, look at the interactions between them and the historical interaction. And this this metric is very, very telling because they can categorize the, the guys that, that buy. Um, they buy without selling. You know, like 75% of their transactions are more Bitcoins coming in, very few leaving. And then they have another category, which is liquid and highly liquid. And those guys are more speculative. Um, you look at their history and the... They buy and they sell and they trade. Um, we can kind of look at that movement between um, speculative hands and long-term holders. And um, obviously, as all the supply moves to the long-term holders, guys that do not sell, you create a cl um, huge supply shock. Um, and there's a, there's a shortage of coins left by the speculators and the price just runs up. And so that's kind of like a demand and supply um, view using their historic behavior. And so that's one of my favorites. Another one is just sheer, um, doing the same thing, but much rougher. Like you say anything in, in, in a wallet held by self-custody or cold storage, 
Those are the coins you cannot buy, and the coins you can buy are the coins that are left on the exchanges. And you can run that ratio and you get a similar kind of a metric. And that's demand and supply also. The, the supply is what's on exchanges, and the demand is that that is held by investors who've got that locked away in cold storage. So those kind of metrics are, are the most telling and, um, and reliable because, um, you know, like, I mean, I, I cut my teeth using um, volume on 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 the on the network because that was a kind of like a proxy to buying and selling right um, there's a direct relationship if, if i'm going to um, buy some coins off someone else they're going to send it to me and you can read that volume moving into my wallet as a um as a trade and so the more trades you get the more investors are coming in so you can look at volume as a proxy to the investment activity and some of the early stuff was like um, based on that like um, my first metric which was the first signal for um, the first on-chain signal for for the coin was NBT which just ran the ratio of that essential volume between investors and the market cap and so very much like price earnings ratio you have the share price and how much earnings um, that company had you can run a ratio of its valuation You've got now in Bitcoin land a um, valuation, the market cap of Bitcoin, and um, how much investment activity is going, which is the sheer volume moving between investors. And that became NVT ratio. And you can see oscillations, you know, when it's high network um, activity by investors um, and very low valuation, then you know it's undervalued. So that's another thing we can do, but um, it's less reliable than this latest generation stuff, which you know, it's, it's it's like the network keeps changing, and um, when you look at sheer volume, you cannot see, you know, like what we've seen in the last um, four years is a mass migration of transactions moving to um, behind the firewall of exchanges, and you cannot see what the investment activity is really happening inside those exchanges. So you're losing signal, and yeah, and that that's another thing around this this. Um, on-chain field is it's con constantly changing because um, the network's changing, you know, we're now moving into an era where we have layers above the base chain, you know, whether that be exchanges or, you know, this the, the, popul the, the popular thing right now is lightning network, so now there's a certain amount of transactions moving to that network that's above the base layer, which we cannot see. So those are examples where things change all the time and you really need to understand what's happening with the network in order to account for it.